thank you, praise team. A little over two weeks ago, I sat in a chapel service in Cedarville, Ohio, at Cedarville University at a praise and worship conference. And every day they have chapel uh, there at that university. And we were able to join them on Friday morning, 10 o'clock. And um, it's just awesome. There's about 3,000 people that go there and uh, they're all in worship. And our group was there. The, the worship group was there as well. There was about 1,000 of them. And it was just a wonderful morning of worship. And the Lord spoke to me while I was there, and I wrote down these four things. And it was a message series that he had spoken to me th through in that time when I was there. And this begins this time, this sermon series that we're going to look at today. And that is this, that Christ is for you, that Christ is in you, and that Christ is working through you. The last one we're going to look at twice. Christ is through you. And so we're going to entitle this Christ is a perfect fit. F-I-T-T. -T, for, in, through, and through you. So this morning we're going to look at Romans chapter 8 towards the end of this passage of scripture. Verse 31 and following. And if you know anything about the study of God in Scripture, all roads kind of lead through the book of Romans. Romans is, is really the pinnacle of the study of God. It is perhaps the greatest uh, of all the Scriptures that are there. And in chapter 8 is kind of the apex of Romans. And where we're going to start today in verse 31 to the end of the chapter is kind of a summation of all that he has written from chapter 5 down to the end that we see. And he is going to give a glorious praise about the, the verses that he is going to share. I want to start out by asking you this, though. Do you think about what others think about you? Do you think about what others think about you? I wonder what he's thinking. I don't think she likes me. He sure was quiet today. I wonder what's going on. Is he mad at me? We often think about what other people are thinking, don't we? But more than that, is do you sometimes wonder what God is thinking about you? Is he mad at me? Is he disappointed at me? Is he always looking for some way to punish me? Does he even know my name? And if he knows my name, does he really care? Paul is going to write here in Romans chapter 8 to settle all those questions. You are hopefully not going to be able to leave here with asking those questions. Does he know me? Does he care? Is he mad? Is he disappointed? Because here's the reason. Because Proverbs 23, verse 7 says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The Good News Bible puts it this way. What he thinks is really what he is. What a man thinks is really what he is. Because what you think will control what you're feeling, and what you think will control your actions. And so it's very important that we are biblically thinking. Because we live in a world, we had a meeting yesterday at, at our house, and we talked about the number of ways in which things come into our thoughts and all the things that happen really quickly. We live in a world that has information coming to us from all directions, all over the place, and most of it is not godly. 
Most of the stuff that's on the internet is not godly. Most of the stuff that you look at on Facebook is not godly. May be all right, but it's not godly. Most of the stuff you see on television, you know and I know is not godly, right? But God's word is godly. So when we surf the internet and we spend time surfing the internet, do we surf God's word too? We should. Because we need to think biblically. We need to think as his word is, which is truth for us. When you grasp what the truth is that God has for us, we do not need to fear. And when it comes to the study of God's word, he gives us this over and over again as a way of being able to say, don't worry about the things that are around you. Put your trust in that which is unseen, but you know to be true. So there's where we start this morning. If you have your, your place found in Romans chapter 8, please stand as we reverence the reading of God's holy word. And we'll begin reading in verse 31. Paul says, What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of all of us, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or the sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long, and we are considered as sheep to the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who has loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And God said, Amen. Amen to his word. He writes here, what shall we say in response to this? In response is, is, is what he has written before, really from chapter 5, verse 1, all the way up until this point, where he proves the salvation of Christ for his believers and how God is bringing them himself, not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And it is as though Paul says with a great big breath, if God is for us, who can be against us. Now, in the Greek, that word if is different than it is in the English. In the English, when you say if, you think of a question mark. In the Greek, when you say if, you think of it in an exclamation point. It means because of, since. Since God is for us, who can be against us? But because God is for us, who could be against us? Exclamation point. It is not a question if he is for you or not. It is a statement of fact that you can celebrate. And we follow up that question with a rhetorical, who can be against us? It is really rhetorical because there is nothing that could possibly be more powerful than God. If God is for us, who can be against us? It really doesn't matter because they're not near as powerful as this God is who's for us. And that's why we see over and over in Scripture these kind of passages. Psalm 18, 118, verse 6, it says, The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Or 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16, Do not be afraid. 
The prophet answered, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Or Psalm 56, 9. My enemies will turn back when I call for help. And by this, I will know that God is for me. Or Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere men do to me? Or Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? The answer to that question is the same answer to this one. No one. Because if God is my refuge and my strength, I do not need to fear anything else. We often see these verses, though, our situations in life sometimes make us think differently than that. What about what I'm going through? What about that diagnosis that I have? What about my in-laws? What about the radical left that's trying to change our country? What about my own fears and my own doubts and my own worries? And the list goes on and on and on. And despite the promises, we sometimes have to endure with the physical and the mental and the emotional struggles. And we wonder if God is truly for us. Well, can I share with you that peace of mind comes when you think obediently according to God's word? When you think obediently according to his word, there is great peace. Paul gives us great instructions here and in the promises that God, the God of peace, will be with us as we practice Christian thinking and Christian action. And he gives us four proofs in this passage and I want to share them with you here's the first one God will freely give us all things because he has already given us his best he will freely give us all things because he has already given us his best he said he which is God the father did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all who is us all that is the church at Rome that he is speaking to how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? If he has indeed given us Jesus Christ, which is the best that he could give us, why wouldn't he give us the little things of life that we need? Why wouldn't he provide for us financially? Why wouldn't he provide for us in times in which we struggle with our own worries. Why is it that we have to doubt him now that we've had the best that he has because he's loved us so much that he gave us his only begotten son, how come I have to question whether or not he's still going to provide? When Linda and I were dating, came to my time when I wanted to ask her to marry me. And I went to a jeweler in town and bought an engagement ring. I didn't have to ask that guy, can I have that little box that goes along with it? Those are such cool boxes. Can I just have, no, you can't have the box. You just bought the ring. No, no to the box. No, the box came with it, right? So here we are in this, that Christ has come, the Father has sent him to us, and we're wondering if we're going to get the little boxes of life that Christ has already provided the greatest thing for us and is still providing for us even yet today. If he didn't spare his own son, he will certainly give us, he says graciously, and the word really means freely. You don't even have to beg him for it. He's already promised to meet every need that you have and that I have. Point number two, proof number two. No one will ever bring a charge against us because we have been judged and acquitted. 
No one will ever bring a charge against us that will work. Verse 33, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Can anyone bring a charge against you, Christian, and make it stick? Satan, the scripture says, is the accuser of the brethren. And he comes into the court of heaven and he says about me, hey, get rid of him. He's a bum. He's a sinner. Have you seen what he did? Have you heard what he has said? Do you know what he has thought? Get rid of him. But there is one who has the thing that comes into his ear that is an advocate on my behalf. And Almighty God hears the accusations and hears them, and his answer is that there is no one who can come against this one. There is no one who comes against him, not even Satan. Why? Because it is God who justifies. You see, we often think that we're less sinners than we really are. And we often think that God is a less savior than we think he really is. When it's the other way around, we are greater sinners than we think we are and he is a greater sinner, a greater savior than we think he is. No one can take us before God and win against us in his court. We have been tried in the highest court of the universe and have been found not guilty. Charles Spurgeon, the great pastor from London days, says, if a judge acquits me, who can condemn me? If the highest court in the universe has pronounced me just, who shall lay anything to my charge? If God, the righteous judge, has declared you innocent because your Savior has paid for your price, then there is no one who can bring a charge against you. I love what Linda's song said. Then we do not need to hear about the sin that he has already forgiven. We don't need to hear about what Christ has already forgiven. And Satan is good about reminding us, is he not? He is great about reminding us and telling us what kind of scum we are, right? You have a chance to be able to listen to it or to cast it out for the truth of what God's word says. The truth of God's word is that from the forest, from the east is from the west, so far he's removed your transgressions from you. And that he is not going to bring them up again. And if he doesn't bring up your sins, we say, well, pastor, what about, what about the sin I do tomorrow? What if I, what if I just blow it tomorrow? I just, I just downright blow it. I make a laughing stock of myself. I just, I, I, I blow it. In order for Jesus not to have forgiven your sin, he would have to be crucified again to forgive the future sins that you will do. But when Jesus died, the truth is that he died for the sins you've done in the past. He's, done, he's died for the sins that you do today, and he has died for the sins that you will do tomorrow. That's why there is no sin. That's why Jesus answered, what sin? What sin? I don't see anything on your ledger. All I see is the blood of my son, Jesus Christ, who has wiped it away. Proof number three. No one will condemn us because Jesus has died and was raised for us. Not just a charge against us, but a condemnation. 
Verse 34. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and also and is also interceding for us. You've heard it said before, if you were the only person alive, Jesus would have died for you. The more truth of that matter is, if you were the only person alive, Jesus would have died for you because you're a sinner. And we are sinners. We are sinners in Christ's eyes up until the moment when we seek his pardon. When that pardon comes, we're no longer sinners. We're now saints. We're no longer in, in a black mode of having darkness or scarlet within us. We are now washed white as snow. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Think about that. We sin because of the very nature of who we are, our sinners. And that because of our nature is who we are. And so we only do what we're naturally then made to do. We are sinners and therefore we will sin. But Christ came and he died upon the cross. In dying upon the cross, he has now paid our price. So no one can condemn you. Hold your finger here in chapter 8, verse 33, and look back at chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Do you see it? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You could circle no if you wanted to in your Bible. There is no condemnation. There is no one who is going to stand in the, in the courtroom of heaven one day and say that man or that woman deserves to go to hell. Not if they're a Christian. It's never going to happen. And that means this. You cannot sin your way out of out of the grace of God. You should never want to try. That is the biggest thing you shouldn't want to do. But you can't sin your way out of the grasp that Christ has on you. He has given you eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. And everlasting life is everlasting life. There is no asterisk by, beside it. It says everlasting life unless you do this and this and this. He has come that we would have life and life eternal. And eternal life by its own definition is eternal. Going on and on and on with no, with no ending. No one will be able to condemn you to hell on judgment day because Jesus Christ died for us and was raised for us. And now, according to this verse, stands at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Why? Because he is for us, not against us. We are eternally secure in Christ. Proof number four. The one I kind of like the best. Nothing will separate us from the love of Christ because you are loved with an everlasting love. Christ loves us. And no enemy, no weapon, no calamity can ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. In fact, you can see, if you read carefully, 17 different things that someone might be able to say, You're going, these will separate me from God's love. 
Let's look at them if we would. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Number one, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? As it is written, Psalm 44, quote, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Probably true in Paul's day, but not true in our day, at least not yet. Verse 37. No, 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 no. That's not us. We're not going to be separated by trouble or hardship or persecution. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. See, we're not conquerors in ourselves. That scripture tells us plainly we are conquerors through him and it tells us because he loves us. And then Paul says, for I am convinced. Boy, we need to take this to heart. Convince yourself today. Put it in your mind. Think about this. That neither death nor life nor angels or demons in the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth. And then if you just don't come up with anything else, he says, nor anything in all of creation, whatever it is I've created, is not going to be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate you from the love of God. So to those who think that it's possible to be able to, to lose your salvation, I would say whatever you would say would be able to lose your salvation is something in creation, even your own willful disobedience to God. Some would say, well, then you're saying that... <clears throat> There's nothing that can separate me from the love of God, then I can live any way I want to because I'm saved. If that's your attitude, you may not be saved. If your attitude is, then I've got the fire insurance, I've got the insurance from God, I am going to live my life, and the church can, I don't need anything about the church, I don't need anything about the word, I have done my deed. Walk the aisle, said a prayer, been baptized, I can live wherever I want to and however I want to. If that's the attitude of your heart, you might have got baptized, but you just got wet. There is no change of heart in someone who desires just to live their own life. And in fact, Jesus says, how precious is his blood. He says that you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, Glorify God with your body. In the way in which you live, we're to bring glory to him, not disgrace. We're not to shun God. We're not to live as though we are sinners when we're really saints. It makes no sense. Christ is for you, Christian man, Christian woman. Because he loves you. You are his very own people. He purchased you with his very own blood. Linda has a cousin who needed a kidney transplant. And somebody in the family offered to give her a kidney. Now, Linda's cousin need, doesn't need to go to them and say, hey, do you love me? You know when somebody has given you a kidney, there has to be a love for you in that. Now, let's take that to a much higher standard. We don't have Jesus who has given us a kidney. We have Jesus who gave us his very life. And if he has given us our life, we shouldn't ever have to wonder whether or not he loves us. He said, no matter what trouble you have, here's a good thought for you. Trouble can take away many things in your life. 
It can take away your happiness. It can take away your prosperity. It can take away your health. It can take away your friends. There's one thing that you can never have that trouble will take away, and that is the love of God. It is sure. It is fixed. What more evidence do we need that God is for us so nothing can be against us? Turn with me, if you would, over to the book of Philippians. Towards the end of your Bible, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians. After Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 4. When we are here to think about what we ought to be thinking about, we need to put our thoughts on what God's word says is true. Because it'll change. What you think about will change your feelings and your actions. Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. This is Paul from a Roman prison. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Imagine, if you would, that a friend asked you out to lunch in Worcester. And you are busy, but you say, hey, yes, I'd like to do that. And so you make the effort to drive over to Worcester. You get there a few minutes early. You're waiting at the table, waiting for your friend to come. And then you realize that they are not on time. They're a little late. And then their little late becomes real late. And in fact, they don't show up at all. And you get a little ticked. There is no phone call. There is no text message. There is nothing. They just don't show up. And you leave the restaurant hot. And you say, I'm not even going to take their call when they call. You know, I've called them. They didn't answer. I'm not going to take their call when they call. So you go all that day seething, thinking, thoughts, probably shouldn't be thinking. The next day you run into your friend's brother. And he tells you, oh, I don't know if you heard, but my brother was in an accident yesterday about noon, and he's in the hospital. What you learn in that moment of truth changes everything, does it not? In that moment of truth, you go from feeling really upset to feeling really bad for your friend. Why? Because now you know the truth. And the truth changes your thoughts it changes your feelings and it changes your actions because what do you want to do at that moment? You want to go be with them, don't you? A couple minutes ago, you were mad as a red hog, right? Country expression, sorry. <laughs> but now, when you know the truth, the truth changes your feelings and it changes your actions. Listen, church, one thing, God is for you.
He's not against you. 